everybody, Professor Davis here, and we are going to look at how cells obtain energy. Now, this is going to be in two parts. This first part is going to talk about gen energy in general, and it's also going to talk about enzymes, whereas part two is going to focus mostly in on cellular respiration. So let's dive in here to energy. So energy flow is really important when we're talking about cells and things like that because metabolism is a big part of this. Metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur inside of a cell. Now, metabolism is the building up of stuff and also the tearing down. So there's those two types of chemical reactions. Now, many living things produce and use energy through these metabolic pathways we're going to talk about. The two metabolic pathways are going to be photosynthesis, which we're going to look at in a future video. Video. And then we're also going to look at cellular respiration. Now, photosynthesis is something that plant cells are able to do, whereas cellular respiration is something that animal and plant cells do. Okay, but animal cells cannot do photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis will be discussed in kind of the next chapter, whereas cellular respiration is going to be talked about in part two. So with these metabolic pathways, there's kind of two different ways that can happen with metabolism when we talk about the building up or the tearing down. So anabolic is going to be the building of polymers. This requires energy. Anytime you build something, energy is going to be required. On the other hand, catabolic reactions are when you're breaking things down, when you're breaking polymers into smaller parts, and they're going to end up releasing energy when this takes place. And so this little picture shows you the anabolic where we're going to build it together, where we took four molecules and we're going to build it together into one. We're going to merge them. Energy is required for this. On the other hand, if we take the bigger molecule with the four and we break them into smaller parts, energy is going to be released. So you have anabolic and you have catabolic. Now, this brings us to a little bit of physics that we're going to need to look at. Okay, we've already talked a little bit about chemistry here. Let's talk a little bit about physics. This first one is going to look at the laws of thermodynamics. But first of all, what is thermodynamics? Thermodynamics is the study of how energy gets transformed, where energy gets transformed into from one type to another type. Now, there's two laws of thermodynamics we're going to look at. And this first law of thermodynamics is also known as the law of conservation. This law states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Okay, we can't create it, we can't destroy it, but we can change it from one form to another. Okay, so we can't create it, we can't destroy it, but we can change it. So an example here is if we were to change the energy from potential energy to kinetic energy. So our first example here is gas in the car. If we put gas into the car, this is a chemical type energy and ultimately it has potential energy. We're going to then burn that gas, break it apart, and this is going to allow the, the car to move. This is known as kinetic energy. Okay, so gas in the car gets converted so that the car can actually move. It's going to allow for a different type of energy. On the other hand, if we look at a cell, glucose is going to be transformed into the chemical ATP, which ultimately that ATP is going to be used to do cell work. So we're going to go from potential energy to kinetic energy. It just takes more steps when we talk about our cells. So this goes from chemical energy to mechanical or movement energy. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be changed from one form to another without the loss of usable energy. So some of this energy gets converted into a type that we cannot use. And guys, it's mostly heat. So when energy is transformed, some of the energy is converted into an unusable form that the cell cannot use for work. Most of this energy is lost. Now we put it in quotes because it hasn't been destroyed and it's not really lost. It's just not that we can use it. It ends up leaving the system as heat. Okay, so it ends up leaving the system as heat. Now heat is not a usable form of energy for cellular work. However, it can be used to warm your body. So going back to the example with the car, we put gas in the car, we turn the car on, we let it run, and this makes the car move. Well, what eventually happens? Some of this is going to get let off as heat, and that's why the hood of your car gets hot, okay? because some of it gets let off as heat. 
On the other hand, if we go from glucose to ATP to the actual cell work, heat's given off at each of these stages. So heat gets generated, which helps maintain, like for us, our body temperature. It helps keep our body temperature constant. It's also why when you work out and you, your muscles move a lot, your cells are doing lots of work, you get really hot because heat gets produced. All right, so what is energy? Energy is going to be the ability to do work or the capacity to do work. Now, where does this ability of us to be able to do work ultimately come from? The sun. The sun is the ultimate source of all energy here on planet Earth, and we call that radiant energy. So living things cannot maintain their organization. We can't grow, we can't repair, we can't reproduce without a constant input of energy. And that constant input of energy is from the sun, okay? Now there's two major categories of energy. The first is kinetic energy, and kinetic is the energy of motion, movement. We call that mechanical energy. The other side of it is potential energy. Potential energy is the energy that is stored. It's stored away as chemical energy. Now, guys, have you ever been told you have potential? Okay, if you've been told you have potential, don't take it as a compliment. Because that means they're telling you that you have what it takes inside of you, but you're not doing it. You're not using it. You're not utilizing those skills. And so we don't want a bunch of potential. We want actual action to take place. So we've got to take that potential energy, that stored energy, and we've got to make it be used for movement. So an example here, potential energy is like what was behind a, ba a, a dam. If you let that water go and it flows, it now has kinetic energy. For this cat, when it's getting ready to jump up on the counter, it has potential energy, but as it springs and it actually jumps, that is kinetic energy. So we actually go back and forth between these two types of energy. Now, potential energy again is that stored energy, and we find that that's stored in the chemical bonds of molecules. These chemical bonds like glucose or even ATP and that high energy last bond in ATP is where we're going to find our potential energy. When chemical bonds are broken, remember when we break bonds, we call that catabolism, we break things apart, energy gets released. Okay, and so we're going to release that energy when those bonds are broken. Now, ATP is great because it provides just enough energy for cell work to be done. So the movement of our muscles, the movement of molecules across the membrane with active transport, which we talked about in a previous video, and this whole idea of the synthesis, the dehydration reactions, chemical reactions that we want to take place in the cells, ATP is just enough energy to get that work done. Okay, so this is why we use ATP as our energy currency. Okay, and these are all examples of kinetic energy inside of your cells or with your cells. So some concepts here we want to look at. Potential energy can be converted into kinetic energy and vice versa. They go back and forth. Conversion of energy is not very efficient. Cells are about 40% efficient, which is actually a lot better than most machines. Okay, because remember, a lot of that energy is going to be transferred as heat, which is not usable. As energy conversions occur, most energy gets changed into heat, and living things continually lose heat or energy to the environment. Therefore, we have to have a constant input of energy, which in our case is from the sun. Now, heat, when it gets released into the environment, heat gives disorder to a system. The amount of disorder in a system is, measure, is measured as its entropy. So the amount of disorder is entropy. Now, guys, the universe as a whole is moving towards disorder, which means more chaos. It takes a lot of work to keep things organized. Think about your purse or your backpack or your house. You work really hard to get that cleaned and organized. But how long does it take for it to go back to the way it was to be messy and to be disorganized? It hardly takes any time. It doesn't hardly take any energy because the world is moving towards chaos.
So let's look at a few other terms. We have exergonic and endergonic reactions. And remember, we're still talking about metabolism. Metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur in a cell. And there's two types of chemical reactions as they relate to energy. The first is endergonic. Now we talked about ender. Ender means inside going in. Gonic means energy. This is a chemical reaction that requires an input of energy. And this is going to happen when we need to build molecules. So these are going to be in our synthesis reactions. So if you look here in the graph, the reactants start with energy down here. We had to add energy to make the products. We had to add a bunch of energy, put energy into it. So this would be like if I take A plus B and I fuse it to make AB. I synthesize a new molecule. Energy has to be put in. An example when we talk about energy sources in your cells, ADP is going to get merged with a phosphate. So ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate. When we add that other phosphate, we now convert it to ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, ATP. But again, energy has to be put into this reaction. So products have to have more potential energy than the reactants because we added it in. On the other side, we have exergonic reaction. Exo means it's exiting, it's leaving, and gonic means energy. So chemical reactions that release energy are exergonic. These are going to be when we break down molecules. Breaking bonds releases energy, and these are the degradation reactions when we break them. So this is where the reactants start with the energy, and when we break them apart, energy gets released. So the products have less energy than the reactants. So this is where I started with AB and I'm going to break it into A plus B. Energy is going to get released. If I take ATP and I break it back into ADP and a phosphate, again, energy is going to get released. So the products have less potential energy than the reactants did. So if you'll notice, these are opposites. So is this an endergonic or exergonic reaction? Okay, so when we look at this, is it endergonic or exergonic? Well, the first one is endergonic because energy went in to the reaction. Okay, so if you look here, CO2 plus H2O moved into a sugar and an oxygen. Solar energy went in, so it's an endergonic. Is it a synthesis or degradation? Did we build something or did we break it apart? Well, if energy went in, we are building it, which is a synthesis reaction. And what cellular process is this? If we put carbon dioxide and water in, we get sugar and oxygen out with solar energy's help. That is photosynthesis. On the other hand, let's look at the bottom reaction. It's the opposite. We have a sugar and oxygen. We see that this is converted into CO2 and water, but 36 to 38 ATP, which is energy, is released. Since energy is released, this is exergonic. Since energy was released and bonds were broken in the process, this is degradation. And this example is cellular respiration. So again, you'll notice that photosynthesis and cellular respiration are opposites. All right. So guys, if we look at this, energy that gets given off in one reaction, a lot of times is used to fuel the next reaction. This means energy released from an exergonic reaction is going to drive an endergonic reaction. So an application here, guys, is the when a degradation reaction takes place and energy is released, that energy is used to synthesize or build something else. So here we have sugar and oxygen. We're going to break it down into CO2 and water. That energy released is going to help make ATP. That is known as cellular respiration. So we had a degradation reaction, which in turn fueled a synthesis reaction. Over here, I have ATP being broken down, degraded into ADP and a phosphate. Energy gets put in. This is going to go where we build something like we see with photosynthesis. All right, so guys, this whole process of energy conversion is important. However, sometimes they need help to do this and to do it very efficiently and quickly. And this is where enzymes are going to come in. Enzymes are going to speed up 
chemical reactions. And when we look at an enzyme, enzymes, remember, are proteins that have a particular shape to them. Remember, proteins fold in a certain way and they have a particular shape. The shape gives us an active site that's present. So enzymes, guys, are organic catalysts, meaning that they're going to speed up reactions. Organic tells you there's carbon and hydrogen. They are normally made out of proteins, which means they can be denatured and unfolded if we're not careful. The purpose is to lower the activation energy, meaning it will take less energy to get the um, reaction started. Okay, because if you've heard that, that term, it takes money to make money. Well, it takes energy to make energy. And so because of this, this conversion may need like a little jump start to go with. We also see that enzymes are very specific. They only work on one particular substrate. They do contain this active site where the substrate fills and they usually end in ACE. And so if you see a word that ends in ACE, it's a good chance it's an enzyme. So guys, the substrate is what goes into the reaction. It's known as the reactant and it's going to bond to the active site. When it bonds into that active site, it's going to get changed ultimately into the product. So the reactant is ultimately going to be changed into the product somehow. Now, this enzyme substrate complex is known as an induced fit model. Now, one good example of this is kind of like a lock and a key. When you put a key into a lock and it turns, it's a perfect fit. And normally it should only fit maybe one area. Think about it. If you went to your neighbor's house and your house key fit in their door and opened their door, what does that mean? That means their house key also fits your front door. We wouldn't like that. We want our key to be unique. And it's the same thing here when these reactants fit in with an enzyme. They're very specific. It's like a lock and key type structure. Now, when it does its job, the enzyme doesn't change in the process. The enzyme comes back out of this reaction and it can go do another reaction because of this. It's unchanged. It's unaltered. But guys, the reactant is not. The reactant is now a product. This is a form. It's formed due to the results of the chemical reaction. So the reactants have actually changed. The substrate has changed into the product. Now guys, this is important because these enzymes speed up these reactions. And without enzymes, chemical reactions within cells would occur too slowly to where the cells would ultimately die. So we rely on enzymes a lot for our cellular um, survival. So enzymes speed up chemical reactions. They do this by lowering the energy of activation. Activation energy is the energy needed to start a chemical reaction. So you can see it here in the picture. Without the enzyme, we have the red. It goes way up before we can actually do the reaction. Whereas the blue cuts the time in half. It makes it a whole lot faster. The active site is the site where the substrate fits in to the enzyme. And this is known as the induced fit model. This model explains how the active site and enzyme alter and slightly accommodate each other. Okay, when we talk about the accommodating the substrate, this helps gives an optimate fit so that the enzyme can do its reaction. And you can see that here in the picture where they fit together. Now, enzymes are specific. They can only react with a certain substrate. They can't just react with whatever. They can only react with a certain substrate. And they usually get named by adding ACE to the substrate name. So if the substrate is urea, the enzyme that breaks down urea is going to be urease. Okay, because ACE gets added to the end. Lactose being the substrate, the enzyme would be lactase because it breaks down the lactose. It takes many time the enzymes to kind of speed up and make these chemical reactions happen in a way that the cell can survive. So with this, because enzymes need to be different, but enzymes can be reused every time, we don't have to make huge, large quantities of them. You may only only have like five of these enzymes, 10 of these enzymes and so on, but you don't necessarily need a ton of them because enzymes are unchanged in the process, which means they can be used over and over and over again. All right, so another little quiz here, is this a synthesis or degradation reaction? Okay, if we look at the first one, the enzyme is gonna take in this polypeptide substrate. 
When it gets into the active site, the enzyme sh changes shape and the product comes out where we went from a four, a four protein molecule to a two, two, two. This one is degradation. It broke it apart. On the other hand, if we look at this other example, two objects went into the enzyme, but only one came out. This one is synthesis. So make sure again, if it breaks it apart, it's degradation. If it builds something new, it is synthesis. Now, enzymes, because they are proteins and they do have to keep a specific shape, there are some things that affect how well or how quickly these enzymes work. Now, the maximum rate that an enzyme works occurs when there's enough substrate available to fill the active sites of an enzyme most of the time. This is known as its maximum rate. Now, there's a couple of things that affect this maximum rate. The first one is substrate concentration. The higher the concentration, the higher the rate to a point. Do you notice how it went up and then it plateaus? Okay, it eventually will plateau. This is when all the active sites are full. On the other hand, we do have temperature. Increased temperature will also increase the rate to a point. Once it gets to that optimal temperature, if we go higher, it starts to decrease. And the reason for this is that the more we heat up an enzyme, the more chances it is it's going to unfold. And if it unfolds, it no longer can do its job. We say that then it's denatured. Remember, we talked about that back with proteins pH, there's an optimal pH and this varies per enzyme. Some enzymes like it acidic, some do not, but we can adjust the pH to the optimal pH. However, if you look at the pH, if we go either direction, either direction away from the optimal pH, the enzyme will denature. Now guys, we are actually going to um, see a lab with this. Okay. There's a lab where we're going to test the enzyme catalase, which is found in potatoes. And we are going to first look at the substrate. If I give it a lot of substrate, how does it react? What's the rate look like? Okay. Another test we're going to do is we're going to change the temperature. We're going to have it where the enzyme's cold versus room temperature versus boiled or hot. Okay. See what happens to the rate. We're also going to look at pH where we're going to have a pH of 3, which is acidic, a pH of 7, which is neutral, and a pH of 11, which is basic, and see how it affects the enzyme. Okay, so these are factors, and we're going to actually take a look in a lab where we're going to see what happens with that. Now, guys, as enzymes are needed to be present for reactions to occur, sometimes they need help. And this help is called cofactors and coenzymes. They may need to be present in order for those enzymes to function. So guys, cofactors are inorganic ions, things like metals, like copper, zinc, and iron. Have you ever looked at a nutritional label and you were like, why is there zinc in this? Why would I need zinc? This is why. Because some of your enzymes require it to work. Okay, so sometimes they need that metal side of it. On the other hand, they may need coenzymes. Coenzymes are organic non-protein molecules, and these are what the cells can make these coenzymes from our dietary intake of vitamins. And this is going to be things like NAD, FAD, and CoA. And guys, these are going to be really important. These coenzymes are going to be really important in cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So guys, if you look here, the coenzyme may need to bond to the protein in order for it to actually create a good intact active site. If that coenzyme was not there, it would have an inactive active site. Now, we talked about things that can help an enzyme. What about things that can inhibit it, prevent it from doing what it needs to do, for prevent it from making the products? Well, there's two types of competitors we can look at here. The first one is going to be competitive inhibition. Now, these are inhibitors who actually compete for the active site. So you see the active site in A, it's normal, the substrate can fit. But in B, a competitive inhibitor has taken the place. Because this would be like if you were looking for a parking spot and you go to get that parking spot and you think it's open and then you pull up there and there's a really small car in there like one of those mini coupes, or better yet, there's a motorcycle parked in that spot. Okay. It's taking the place. You no longer could fit there. Even though it looked like there was room, there's really not. Okay. So it changed the active site, made it unavailable. 
Okay, that's a competitive inhibitor. On the other hand, a non-competitive inhibitor is going to be an inhibitor set in an allosteric site. It's in a vicinity of the active site. It does not actually um, take the place of the active site, but it changes the shape just enough to where the substrate cannot fit. This would be like another example where you find that parking spot, but you can't park there because there's a giant pickup truck that's on the line. It makes the parking space just small enough that you no longer can fit because someone else didn't park cor correctly. That would be a non-competitive inhibition, okay? A non-competitive inhibition. So you have competitive, it actually takes the active site, or non-competitive, which binds somewhere else, but it changes the active site. So inhibitors, guys, are usually reversible, but in some cases, like poisons, they are not, okay? This means that the enzyme is rendered useless if it cannot be reversed. Now, this brings us to something that our cells do with inhibition. That's called feedback inhibition. This is a normal mechanism that cells use to control the amount of product in a complex metabolic pathway. So I started with product or with the reactant A. This is what I want to change ultimately into something that I call E. I've got to change it to B first. In order to change it from A to B, I need an enzyme. And I'm going to call that enzyme A-ACE because it adds a ACE to the end. I then need to change B to C. That's going to use B-ACE. C gets changed to D with C-ACE. And D gets changed to my final product with the last enzyme, D-ACE. E is what I need. But guys, once I have enough E, I have enough E, I don't need any more. I want to shut this pathway down. So what E does is it binds to A-ACE. It binds to an allosteric site, shutting off the enzyme, making it where it no longer can interact with A. Now this is temporary because eventually when I run out of E, okay, so E binds, making A not be able to bind. When I run out of this, I can take E off and it starts the pathway again. Guys, it's like an on off switch, like in your house for a light. You turn it on, light comes on, turn it off, the light goes off. Same thing here. Note that each step requires its own enzyme. So if I get too much of a certain product, I can shut the pathway off. When I don't have enough of the product, I can turn it back on. This is reversible. So this is reversible. So quick review. Factors that affect rate versus maximizing the rate of reactions, you need to look at things like temperature, pH, substrate concentration, and inhibitors. Those are all things that ultimately could affect the rate of an enzyme and how it works. So guys, ATP structure and function. Let's talk briefly about this. So all cells use ATP for energy. It's our common currency for energy. It's what is the best way for our cells to be the most efficient. Remember the structure of ATP is a nucleotide. It does contain a ribose sugar. This ribose sugar is connected to an adenine nitrogen base, and it does have three phosphates. Thus, it's named adenosine triphosphate. Now, remember that we can convert this into adenosine diphosphate plus a phosphate when we break the bond. When we break that bond, energy gets released. And remember that energy being released can then be used somewhere else in the cell. Now, this is reversible and we can go back the other direction, okay? We can end up taking ADP and a phosphate and we can store that energy. So we have it where we can go back and forth in this reaction. So why do we use ATP in our cells? Well, guys, ATP has just enough energy being released so that only a little bit of it is wasted, we want it to be as efficient as possible. So consumption and regeneration of ATP's entire pool, like if I use all the ATP the cell has, and then I rebuild it back to where I create this pool of ATP again, this happens about every minute. So a cell uses all the ATP, builds it back, uses it, builds it back, and that happens every minute. So your cell is pretty efficient at doing this. This finishes up this kind of intro into energy and enzymes. And if you have any questions, please let me know.